Hi, you guys. This is Richard Sachs, your host on Lost Arts Radio. It's nice to be with you again, and hope you had a good week. Um, we've got a really important show today, a great guest. It's a friend of ours, Ken Rolla, who's a um, an engineer and a designer and a health teacher and a lot of other things, too. We'll let him tell you more detail about what he's doing now. And the reason that I particularly wanted to invite him on the show for uh, tonight is that as people who are paying attention learn more about this 5G rollout, as they call it, uh, installing these so-called small cells in cities all over the world, certainly in parts of the U.S. and probably where you're living if you're in another country. Um, maybe not talking about it, but it, it's a worldwide program. And as people find out more about it, they're learning it's not great for their health and that the intent is to make it inescapable. So it's covering uh, every square inch of the earth, including even the ocean from satellites. And um, people are kind of concerned about that, seeing how they can fight it. There are programs working against it, like InPower and other ones that are trying to come up with legal um, common law or otherwise legal s- solutions. Um, there are some indications of good potential progress in some of those. Other ones are still in the theory stage, most of them, and just hoping that they'll be able to do something. So we l- need to look at all aspects of potential solutions to that, including uh, stopping it, but also if it doesn't stop, how, how you can keep yourself in good shape anyway. And um, leading up to that, we'll go over some of the basic idea of, of why it even matters what what the field is, what microwave technology is about and why it's of any interest to us um, and how you can best respond. So thanks for being with us, Ken. I really appreciate it. It's always fun to talk to you. So thanks. Likewise, for Richard. It's always a pleasure to be on your show. Um, so just to, to cover for the new people, as we always try to do, um, amazingly, you know, to some of us that are really in tune with the developments in this subject and, and other related ones, it's surprising that the majority of people still don't know what a 5G is other than that more movies faster. And they, most of them really don't know why you would even care about turning off a router in your house or what the issue is. I mean, it's all government approved. So why are these uh, conspiracy theorists worried about it? So <clears throat> I'd like to go back to the, the basics for a minute and okay. say how this, how this differs from wired technology, what it means in simple terms, and how it affects people and other life forms. Okay. Well, first of all, people are not aware that a lot of the health issues that they have are heavily influenced by the EMF that we already have on this planet, EMF being electromagnetic fields. And uh, Dr. Robert O. Becker and Dr. Bob, Bob Beck were two pioneers in measuring uh, and quantifying the effects of EMF on physical organisms. And, you know, 20 years ago, they estimated that the EMF on the planet was about somewhere between 750 million and a billion times above normal. And, uh, you know, normal we, being if there's none of this kind of technology, right? Exactly. Yeah. If there were no human intervention on this planet with wireless technologies, um, you know, say like 100, 150 years ago, Right. Um, it's roughly, you know, at 20, 25 years ago when they were studying it, they said it was around a billion times uh, above what it used to be prior to our intervention. Uh, now that's got to be way, way beyond with, uh, yeah. you know, 4G wireless. compared to now. Exactly. I mean, now we've got, of course, a lot more uh, wireless technology for cell phones, but not just that. We've got military systems, communication systems, warfare systems energy weapons, um, electromagnetic and scalar, and um, there's just a lot, lot more use of wireless technology. I mean, common sense. Talking about anything that sends an electrical signal without a wire. Correct. Basically, right? Okay. Correct. Yeah. And so, I mean, you know, it's, it's pervasive in our lives. We've got, you know, wireless lights and, and uh, motion detectors and all kinds of stuff that we use just commonly. You can get at a Home Depot and, you know, places like that. So that that type of uh, technology is ubiquitous and it's around us a lot. And of course, Wi-Fi and and uh, wireless internet and those kinds of things. Um, typically, those are so cellular technology, and I'd say Wi-Fi 
uh, are two of the biggest that affect most people because most people use cell phones and most people have wireless uh, internet around their homes. Even if they don't have Wi-Fi in their own homes, typically their neighbors do. So in most neighborhoods, even if you're not using Wi-Fi yourself, you're, you're embedded in a lot of other people's wireless networks. So the, the body and, and all organisms, all living organisms are being immersed in this. And uh, what's the problem with that? Well, the problem is there have been thousands of, of scientific studies showing the effects now of non-ionizing uh, wireless radiation on living organisms, and none of it's good. You know, uh, it interferes with cellular communication. The body at a cellular level is uh, the cells are talking to each other with electromagnetic frequencies, radio frequencies, with scalar frequencies, with sound, with ele- electrochemical impulses. So the cells of the body are, are communicating by another kind of wireless technology, right? Right. It's, called it's just not compatible with the one you're talking about. Correct. And the microbes in the body, they're actually more non-human cells in the body than there are human cells and all of those are communicating with each other and with the with the body um, in mass and uh, in various different modalities and so electromagnetic radiation interferes with that and it's kind of like static on a radio station when there's just a little bit of it it's just annoying and the body can deal with it for the most part but when it gets to be too strong uh, it's kind of like you can't hear the radio station at all, and cells can't communicate with each other, and all this um, activity going on in the body can't happen properly, then you wind up with major diseases. But well before you come down with cancer, which, by the way, has been proven now that cell phones cause cancer, um, even the CDC admits it now. Right. Wow. Um, even though you've got that going on, well before you get a, an obvious disease that you can relate to wireless technology, it affects the body in ways that kind of grind you down and causes degeneration and other health issues that most people aren't even aware uh, is related to wireless technology. For example, one of the big ones is sleep problems. Sleep problems are pandemic on this planet. And uh, you know, if you take a, a straw poll of any, <laughs> any group of people, you're probably going to find at least three quarters of the people have major sleep problems. And that has to do with wireless technology also operating at billions of cycles per second. The body is designed to operate at just a few cycles per second. Uh, For example, the brain and the nervous system, they connect with a pulsing in the Earth's atmosphere called the Schumann resonance, which operates at around 8 hertz. Uh, And and there's actually several different frequencies that are between 5 and 15 or so hertz or cycles per second and so the body entrains with that and that slows us down and relaxes us and gets us into deep sleep states at night and slows the brainwave states down so that you get into delta, theta and gamma brainwave states when you go to sleep at night. But when you've got wireless technology around operating at billions of cycles per second like cell phones, like Wi-Fi, etc., the brain and the nervous system, they are designed to entrain with any kind of pulsing. So they try to entrain with this wireless pulsing and it just frazzles them. And so it winds up accelerating brainwave states and cellular functions and all sorts of things. And so you can't get to sleep at night. When your brain gets accelerated and your your mind can't slow down so it's hard to sleep at night, it, that also affects the thyroid, which affects a whole litany of health issues in the body, including sleep. And so it's like this self-compounding issue that most people have no idea that these problems that they have uh, are linked to uh, EMF from wireless technologies. So that is something that I've been showing people how to quantify and how to measure in their bodies because there are technologies that can measure the damage from this stuff, show you what's going on. Uh, And then the solution, of course, is a combination of uh, avoiding the technology as much as possible, using protection. There are certain types of technologies we can talk about that will help protect you against electromagnetic fields. Uh, and in the case of 5G wireless, uh, this is a whole new animal which we can talk about, but 5G, is there's nothing like it. There's no precedent for what's coming because um, the companies are planning on sending up 20,000 satellites beaming millimeter wave uh, signals down to the earth to towers every 500 to 600 yards all across the planet. Hundreds of millions 
of these towers are going to be every 500 to 600 yards all across this planet. So you're not, no one's going to be able to escape the electromagnetic fields from this technology. And because it's what they call beam forming technology, rather than immersing us in kind of a widespread field, these transmission towers and satellites send a directed beam to a either a tower or a cell phone or whatever. <laughs> and so it, it has to be able to penetrate buildings. It's much more intense than, say, a non-localized EM field from, like, Wi-Fi or something. So we're going to be immersed in this unprecedented, deadly uh, electromagnetic radiation many, many, many fold times over what we've been exposed to so far. And um, this, there's been plenty of science showing what this kind of radiation does to physical beings, and uh, it's not good. It, it looks like, from what experts are saying, that this technology is probably going to wipe out most of the life on this planet over time. Um, and it's just now starting to be rolled out. Um, and it'll take some time to get all these satellites up in two, three years, but they're fast-tracking this because the FCC, there are multiple agendas and different levels of awareness with these technologies, um, but the FCC knows that it's going to be a battle to try and immerse the whole planet in massive amounts of EMF, uh, and there are you know, certain agendas that some people are aware of, uh, so they're trying to fast track this and not have public scrutiny over it at all. Uh, and so we've got to we've got to combat this. We've got to stop it before it happens. Right. And and I know that the local communities like the the town where I went to the uh, city council meeting about it, they're saying right off the bat, well, we'd really like to hear what you think about the health issues, but unfortunately, State and federal governments are telling us that it's illegal to bring them up. So what they're saying basically is even if this kills you, there's a law passed that you have to not complain about it. And people are just going with that in most places. Exactly. It's, it's, it's amazing to me how uh, willing people, especially public officials, are willing to give up our constitutional rights. I mean, obviously, we no longer have a constitutional republic in the United States. But... There is the, you know, the facade of that. And, um, and so, you know, it's the very, very rare public official or person that's willing to stand up and say, it's illegal, you know, to pass these laws like making it illegal to sue a drug company if they harm you or making it illegal for a municipality to be even bring up uh, health issues relating to uh, wireless technology. I mean, that's insane. And it's yeah. completely unconstitutional, illegal. So we've got to we've got to take back our power, as you mentioned, through things like the Empower Movement, um, which is putting these all of these companies involved and governments involved on notice that they will be legally liable if they harm us. Uh, so yeah, it's yeah, it's insane it, it, what's going on. It's really the question: if there's a law passed that you have to be killed for nothing. Does that mean you just have to go along with it? Right, and that's why I believe there's a, there are a lot of different agendas and justifications for implementing 5G technology, but I think ultimately it's about reducing the population of this planet drastically and quickly. Yeah. Uh, because I know when I worked in the medical system for 23 years, what I saw in that, that triumvirate of the medical system, the food industry, and the insurance industries, they're designed, they're weaponized, and they're designed to reduce population on this planet. And it's working because if you look at investment um, advising and in uh, insurance actuarials now, for the first time in history on Earth, the death rate is equal to the birth rate. You know, we've had the birth rate exceeding uh, the uh, death rate for, for as long as humanity has been around, but for the first time ever now. It's uh, their neck and neck equal, and the death rate is expected to exceed the birth rate. And this right. is part of the reason why countries are wanting to have uh, borderless uh, immigration, uh, because you know if you've got a shrinking population, particularly if you've got you know fewer young people being born, then you've got fewer workers and taxpayers and people that can generate income for the economy. And so they want to be able to shift populations around 
uh, and kind of spread them around so that economies will continue at the rates they've been going at, which, of course, yeah. won't work. Well, I think that, yeah, we are being told that by the people whose perception is pretty shallow and they're just looking at next year's workforce and things like that. But the people that step back at all and look at that know that it's mainly to destroy the countries. Right. You know, right. It, it, it might, they might be saying that it's for workers, but with the kind of immigration, illegal immigration, and they're trying to make us leave out that word illegal and think it's the same, you know. But with the kind of illegal immigration that they're doing mostly quarterbacked by the UN, I'm pretty sure that it goes right in line with the UN program to end sovereign countries. Because you can't have a very good global tyranny that works if you have these irritating separate countries making their own. Right, you know, and global and, trade with no barriers, you know. Yeah, well. exactly. So yeah. you use slave labor wherever you can find it to the biggest markets and just play areas against each other. Yeah, um, there are many agendas with this, of course, and different levels of awareness. It's like when I worked in the medical system, you know, people at the, let's say, this executive level of health organizations in the United States. I used to, you know, do presentations and meet with these people at the state and national policy level, mm -hmm. and they all believed that what they were doing in the medical industry was beneficial for the public. And they believed yeah. that because, you know, they're all reading the same trade journals. They're all reading magazines uh, that are published for CEOs of corporations and healthcare organizations and stuff. And those magazines are all owned by the same handful of companies. Um, it's like when I was in uh, IT at work, you know, I've discovered that the 300 and some magazines, the trade journals for the information technology industry, they're all owned by one company, International Data Group. Wow. <laughs> and so in the same way, this information that these people have access to is all being controlled and they're being fed oh, this is the trend, this is what to do, and blah, blah, blah. And so they yeah. just buy into it and believe it. Well, also in so-called higher education, uh, you're trained that when you're writing all these papers, you have to use unquestionably trustworthy sources, such as the journals you just mentioned. And <laughs> exactly. They, and government agencies are okay, too, because they always tell the truth. So once <laughs> you're, you're educated that those are the reliable sources, then when you finally at least physically escape from the educational system, your mind is still in it, of course, then you just believe whatever they tell you on television or however it comes out. Exactly. But it's a very well-designed system. Yeah, it really is. It's diabolically genius, uh, brilliant, um, yeah. you know, unfortunately. But, um, you know, people are waking up, but we've really got to get them woken up quickly with this 5G stuff or it's going to be too late for humanity. Um, you know. I have a couple of questions from what you already said that um, I wanted to bring up. One was that you were tell, talking about that the electrical system of the body has a tendency to entrain with, in other words, resonate with, I guess, whatever it's in contact with in, as far as frequency goes. So you have things, you know, vibrating at millions of times per second and or higher. And you have the natural frequency, which you said Schumann resonance of the Earth, which I think is what supposed to be 7.83 hertz when they, right. if there's right. nothing interfering with, interfering with it. And so, in training, the reason that you'd be designed that way is if you're walking barefoot on the Earth, which is, I guess, what you're designed to do, at least in clean, safe areas, that your bare skin picks up the Schumann resonance, and it kind of uh, harmonizes with your whole body. So the right. entraining is a positive thing that we're designed to do. Well, very much so, and it's because we are a part of a, a galactic matter energy circuit. And so human beings are fractal antennas, fractal being just a branching like a tree. But this energy that creates everything in the cosmos, um, scientists now are calling it scalar waves or scalar energy, uh, but it's this superluminal light that f comes out of the centers of galaxies and it spirals and it branches as it goes or fractals as it goes. And it's relayed outward from the centers of galaxies f through the suns and the planets because it's been discovered at the centers of suns and planets they have black holes or 
um, singularities that are like these portals for this energy to flow through. So this energy is relayed from the center of the galaxy outward from sun to sun to sun and out to the planets. And so we've got this giant galactic energy circuit. And when that energy comes down to us, it's coming down from our sun and up from the center of the earth. And we are antennas that pick it up. Our brain, our nervous system, or fractal antennas that pick it up. The blood system in the body, it's a fractal antenna. The body itself is a fractal. It's a branch. And uh, same thing with plants. Plants are all fractal antennas, and all living organisms actually are fractal scalar antennas. So we're designed to pick up this energy. And, you know, we operate at a pulse that relates to the frequencies of the universe itself. For example, why is the average human heartbeat 72 beats per minute and not 150? Mm -hmm. uh, it's because this energy coming from the centers of galaxies, it pulses at certain frequencies. And so when it comes down to Earth and it creates the Schumann resonance, which is simply this energy from the sun coming down and striking the surface of the Earth and bouncing back up and hitting, hitting the ionosphere and then bouncing back down. And it just does that continually 24-7. So that frequency of that energy bouncing is the Schumann resonance. And so that's linked to the frequency of the whole cosmos. And so we are part of this galactic circuit. And it doesn't end at our scale. It goes on into the body, into the cells, into the nervous system, into the blood system, into the lymph system, into all of these different structures that pick this energy up and send it down into the, the cell level and the uh, molecular level and the atomic level and the subatomic level. So this energy is like pervasive through everything. It flows from the galactic scale to the subatomic scale and we are antennas that pick it up and that's why we operate at the frequencies that we do. They're natural frequencies that we've been designed to operate at. So when you bring in these artificial uh, wireless devices that are operating at thousands or millions or billions of cycles per second, it's going to frazzle us. Uh, we try to entrain with it. That's what we do. And all living organisms do. You know, it's not just humans. Right. Plants, animals, microbes, everything. Yeah, you bring up the heart rate for humans. It's like that's one of the parts of the signature of that species, right? Human beings. Right. Because if you're a hummingbird, you have a different heart rate. Or exactly. An or a whale or things like that. Exactly. It has to do with the scale and the, the structure of the organism. Um, you know, but you look at the cycles of everything in the human body and it, it relates to this pulsing in the atmosphere that comes from the center of the galaxy. Right. Um, and next, you mentioned that to measure the damage that this ultra high frequency is doing to the body, there are certain technologies. Um, what kind of stuff is that? Well, <laughs> in order to protect against the EMF that we've had up to this point, it was mostly sufficient if you avoided the technologies and if you used EMF protectors on the sources of EMF around you uh, and were smart about the use of the technology. Mm -hmm. But with 5G, because it's going to be ubiquitous and blanketing the entire planet, you won't be able to do that. So <clears throat> up to this point, what we've been able to do is basically, number one, maintain our health with proper nutrition and diet, exercise, that kind of stuff. Uh, particularly as you get older, it becomes more important. Um, <clears throat> protecting yourself by putting scalar energy devices on your wireless technologies. For example, there are little devices you can put on cell phones that will emit a localized scalar field and that will structure the electromagnetic radiation coming off of them and make it less damaging. Uh, so putting EMF protection on your devices, avoiding the use of the devices. So for example, with a cell phone, only using it when you need to, not using it as a handheld computer, not ever holding it in your hand when it's operating, using an air tube headset with it. So for example, you know, I travel a lot. I'm not a Luddite. I'm a technologist. I, I love technology. I use it a lot. But right. with cell phones, you know, I've got a smartphone. It's loaded up with apps. And when I travel, I use them but I never hold that thing in my hand. And believe me, I've had lessons in this when I've been traveling, particularly overseas, using GPS and that kind of stuff, uh -huh. and even having it in proximity when it's running a lot. Uh, I started feeling like I was gonna have a heart attack, and that's actually one of the symptoms of uh, EMF overexposure. And if you, uh, don't, 
if you don't feel that, if you're not conscious of it, it doesn't mean it's not happening, right? Exactly. It'll manifest in different ways depending on people's health and genetics and, and a lot of different factors, other stressors that they're exposed to. But, um, you know, and just because you don't feel it in the moment, you could up and wind up with cancer or something like that. Uh, you know, this stuff doesn't happen overnight. Right. Uh, but, you know, the mainstream media, you know, likes to pretend like, oh, that cancer is a mystery and that, oh, if, you know, yeah. when, when yeah. it happens, people yeah. are just shocked. We and just surprised. know we have to give more money to the drug companies, though, so we can cure it. <laughs> exactly. But all of this stuff, if you know how to measure it, uh, you can see the damage going on well before it ever manifests as a major illness. Uh, so, and we'll get into that. Um, but as far as protection goes, you, you've got to avoid use. Uh, Wi-Fi, for example, you know, use wired connections instead of wireless. If it's absolutely not possible, then put your at least put your Wi-Fi router on a timer so that it shuts off at night, so that it's not running while you're trying to sleep. Um, because your brain will try to entrain with it while you're sleeping and you won't get into deep sleep states and that really accelerates aging and disease yeah. when you get into those deep sleep states. Sleep is uh, the only time really that you're rebuilding your body right every day. Exactly. That's when the body heals and rebuilds. Yeah. That's when the cells regenerate. And so if you're not getting enough sleep and then to top it off, you're not getting into deep sleep states, then mm-hmm. you're really, really degrading your health and eventually it will slam you. And so, just because you don't necessarily feel it or think you feel it or equate what you're feeling with wireless technology yeah. doesn't mean that it's not having the effect on you. Yeah, I uh, think language that's used is often misleading because we're told that a certain practice or a certain technology or being near something involves a risk. And I don't believe that at all. I think it doesn't involve a risk because the risk says, well, it might hurt you or it might not. And there's a percentage chance that it could. It's guaranteed damage. It's just like Dr. Molden, before he was killed, said that was happening with people getting injected with things to supposedly prevent disease. And he was saying, no, it's guaranteed risk every time, or sorry, guaranteed damage every time. And was right. telling people how to recognize it. Right. And I there's think been, it's the same with this, right? Yeah, there's been plenty, plenty of science done on this. Uh, it, you know, the claim from the cell companies, wireless carriers, is that, oh, there's no scientific evidence showing. Uh, well, that's not true. That's an absolute lie. There are thousands and thousands of studies. Just the Bioinitiative Report, for example, is an amalgamation of over 2,000 studies on electromagnetic fields and their effect on physiology. But there are many thousands other, of others. Uh, the Department of Defense has done their own studies because they want to know what the effects of these fields and radiation are on soldiers because they need to know in battle environments. So it's not like we don't know. It's not like the military and the governments don't know. And it's not like the cell phone companies don't know. They've done their own science and they've tried to hire shills to, uh, you know, create fake science saying that they're not damaging to confuse the issue. Right. Uh, Dr. George Carlo, for example, is one of them. He was actually, he was hired by the cigarette industry years ago to be a shill for them, and he actually did some skewed science for them, uh, trying to support the um, idea that cigarettes weren't dangerous for people. Yeah. And so, because of his work doing that, the cell industry uh, hired him to do the same thing for them. Uh-huh. Uh, but when he looked at the data, it was so horrendous. He said, "I can't lie about this. This is just too bad." I, so he turned 180 and, and started exposing how bad cellular um, technologies are for people. So the science is out there, there's plenty of it. You can go on Google Scholar and just look for, you know, on um, EMF radiation um, health effects or on Google or DuckDuckGo or whatever. Mm -hmm. There's plenty of science being done. You can just go to the Google the bioinitiative report and go look at that. That's a couple thousand studies. And uh, also um, another really good new source of information for people to look at uh, there's a friend of mine named Sasha Stone who um, did a t- made a two-hour video. He interviewed experts on EMF uh, of various um, stripes and put it all together in a really well-done video. Yeah. Uh, if you go to YouTube and search on Sasha, S-A-C-H-A, Stone 5G, you can find it. It's called the 5G Apocalypse. Right. I saw it. It was a great video. Yeah, very well done. He interviewed experts on energy weaponry and EMF and other things. And 
you know, the consensus with any scientists who have looked at this is it's insane to extend what we're doing and not cut back what we've already done. You know, we're killing ourselves with what we've done up to this point. To add 5G onto it is for sure a death wish. Yeah, just accelerating it. Right. And you you mentioned um, protective devices that you could put on devices that you use, even if they're wired, right? They're emitting something. Yeah, yeah. wired devices do emit, but not as nearly as much as wireless devices, of course. But, right. you know, getting back to what you can do to protect yourself, uh Avoid use. You know, like I said, I have a smartphone. I've got all these apps. When I travel, I use them, but I don't ever hold the phone in my hand. I either put it in uh, airplane mode or ideally I keep it turned off unless I'm using it for GPS or something like that. And when uh, you do use it so you don't hold it in your hand, do you put it on a desk or something? Or I either put it on a desk or a table or I found this out the hard way. If I'm doing walking GPS somewhere, like in another country typically... Uh, I use a selfie stick. I'll put my phone in a, in a selfie stick and keep it oh. a couple of feet away from me. Okay. You know, because so I learned... Take a picture of yourself, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, and, and that's it. You know, these... P- part of what this... We'll get into, you know, the surveillance aspects of 5G in a moment. But uh, for protection, you know, you've got to avoid use. And also, when you put your phone in airplane mode, that doesn't shut off all the EMF. I found this out very interesting when I when I traveled abroad, uh, and I found uh, my GPS didn't work, and I didn't have cell service, and I found out you can download Google Maps to your phone, and you can navigate with the maps on your phone, right? Mm-hmm. And I thought, well, how does this work? Because it worked perfectly. It worked flawlessly. And I thought, how does this thing know where I'm at? It knows where you're at because there's a built-in radio transmitter that talks to satellites even when your phone is in airplane mode. So So what's airplane mode for, and how is it different than turned off? Well, originally airplane mode was put on phones because, believe it or not, it's not about uh, concern about the phones interfering with the airplane avionics and that kind of stuff. That's not what it's about. It actually, back in the old days, cell phones were so strong and the networks were so, they broadcast so widely you could actually interfere with a cellular network with the airplanes flying over. You know, if you think about all these people in this plane with cell phones, if they're all running and they're flying over towers and trying to connect to these towers, it would create havoc with the cell networks. Oh. So that's why they implemented um, while, uh, uh, um, airplane mode on cell phones. It's just so that it won't interfere with the, the ground-based networks. That's not as big of an issue these days. But... Um, but what does that mean the phone is doing? Is it What's different well, it between that and off, turned off? It shuts off the cellular service, but it doesn't shut off the radio transmitter in there that talks to satellites. And also, this was shown to me by an NSA scientist, and I didn't even know this. Cell phones also have a skater wave technology built into them so that they can surveil you and track you even if your phone is off. Wow. And so... Scalar technology is a type of energy. It's a subtle energy that's basically superluminal light. It's light energy that travels billions of times faster than the speed of light, conventional speed of light. And it's basically instantaneous the way it works. And so this technology can pass through matter like it's not even there. And so it's very effective for interstellar communications and weaponry and all kinds of stuff. So, you know, the... When you're a technology company, this is something I've learned because I've worked in technology companies and my wife has too. When you have a technology that the powers that be or the governments or the military consider strategic, they will come to you and show up at your door and say, we want you to build us a back door or put this feature in or whatever uh, so that they can utilize it. And um, so with these cell phones... Um, they've got all kinds of spying technology built into them, of course, including the apps that uh, come with them. Um, you know, obviously, people know about Facebook and the spying that's been going on with that, but most people don't seem to understand that all of the software that you use for free on these phones are doing facial recognition. Anything that utilizes the camera or your finger touch or your voice, it's recording your voice, it's recording your fingerprints. Is recording your fa- is doing facial recognition, and uh, so when you see these these apps like WhatsApp and WeChat 
uh-huh. and uh, Snapchat and all these different types of apps. When, when you have something for free technologically on the internet or on a phone or whatever, you're the product. They're collecting data on you and selling it. You're the product. You don't get a free ride. You know, so it's not easy. entirely because they like you so much. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know, Google Docs and all these Google apps and things, the reason they're free is because they're, spa- they're all part of a surveillance system. And, you know, I'm not just like reading conspiracy theories. I'm talking to people in these agencies, in the CIA, in the NSA, uh, in the military, who share this stuff and, uh, and people that are sharing it publicly. For example, William Binney, who was the chief technology officer of the NSA, has been revealing for a few years now all of the incredible ways that the NSA spies through all these different technologies. And they take all of this data and they put it into a gigantic database in Utah that's just a humongous facility. And he said it's ridiculous the amount of data they collect. They, Of course, they don't um, analyze all of it. They do analyze a lot of it. But when you become a person of interest, then they can utilize that data yeah. against you in great detail. You know, if it's fine on you using scalar technology, then, and even when the phone's off, then putting a Faraday cage or a metal bag around your phone wouldn't help at all. Correct. Because the scalar waves can go through that, right? Correct. Exactly. Yeah. You can wrap your phone in a metal, you know, aluminum foil or a metal box or whatever, and that acts as a Faraday cage and will shield it from conventional electromagnetic transmission, but not scalar. And um, the NSA scientist who told me about this technology embedded in these cell phones, and he speaks about it publicly. It's not like you know he was covert about this. Um, he said, I, I said, well, you know, how do you keep your phone from spying on you? He said, leave it in your car, wherever you're at, keep it yeah. away from Mail it to another country or something. Yeah. I, I recently put mine in a metal, a stainless steel pot with a lid on it, just as an experiment, and called it from the computer and it rang in the mm-hmm. pot. So, wow. and that, I don't think that was scalar technology. It was just making a phone call. Wow. And somehow it went through a stainless steel pot. Yeah, I keep mine in a metal file cabinet, and that does block the conventional signals. But, okay. um, and and actually, like a lot of times, I keep it in my car. <laughs> yeah. But um, but so to protect yourself against this stuff, you've got to avoid buying into all of these these apps and things. Now, again, I use a phone. I I use these apps. I don't use Snapchat and those kinds of things, and but I do use GPS and those kinds of things for travel. Happy Cow, for example, which is a great app for finding vegan and vegetarian restaurants where you're at. Um, so, you know, I do use one. But I one thing I've done that I'm, uh, you know, will help minimize the overt surveillance by marketers. It's not going to stop, you know, the, the alphabet agencies. Right. But it will stop the overt stuff that marketers do. Is I, I got a cell phone. I got a no-contract phone um, in a fake name. And um, I buy minutes with cash, and I bought the phone with cash, so it's not linked to my name, and I put it in a fake name. How do you buy minutes with cash when they're asking you to do it through a card? Well, you can go to stores like drugstores or, you know, Walmart or Target or whatever. Like buy a $50 card or something. Yeah, yeah, and so I'll buy like a year's worth of those and just load the phone up with a bunch of minutes, and, yeah. uh, you know, and, and it just works. But it, it does, they don't know it's my name. Now, I'm not deluded into thinking that, you know, that the alphabet agencies don't know because they can do voice voice recognition and, and fingerprint recognition and facial recognition. And, you know, they can correlate with their data and they'll know who you are. But you've got to be you've got to be a real problem child for them to go to that trouble. Yeah, they so, don't have time to do that with everybody. Yeah. It? So it does help keep the tracking down and, and linking it to other devices, you know, as well computers yeah. or Roku boxes or whatever. Um, there's some really interesting videos, by the way, on YouTube where people are showing how um, how instantaneously Google will spy on you and track you because there, there are people that will say something into the microphone of their computer, then go to their phone or another device and ads for what they were talking yeah. about show up on their other device immediately. So it does listen to you. These these different apps and things do listen to you. They're collecting data constantly. And you may think, well, I don't have anything to hide, but everybody has stuff to hide. Because if they don't, give me a call and let me have your checking account numbers and your credit card numbers. Right. And, uh, you know, 
<laughs> I yeah. haven't yet met a family that doesn't have their skeletons in the closet. So, right. and even without skeletons, I mean, the fact that you have a credit card doesn't mean that that's a skeleton necessarily. But right, exactly, it's something you and, don't want to just give away to every. Everybody. And there are things that you may think that you don't need to be concerned about. That, uh, or you may want to be in a situation that you didn't predict and become a person of interest. You know, mm-hmm. for example, I mean, one one of the things William Binney said was that you can become a person of interest just by living in a certain geographic area, if somebody else who's a person of interest happens to be within your area. Right. You know? right. So you don't know why you know you might become a person of interest and you might wind up having a problem. You know, I mean. Even doing the kind of stuff that I'm doing, I've been in war protests, I've been in various kinds of public protests, like against GMOs and things like that. Right. I speak publicly all the time about solutions for 5G and GMOs and yeah. geoengineering and chemtrailing, all that kind of stuff. And, and you're not you supposed need. to let people know that those are even problems. Exactly. And But I'll, I can tell you this, when I get too public with that kind of information in front of large audiences... Four times now, I have been hit with energy weapons. And because of the work that I do, I know how to utilize technology that can determine that that's what's going on. And Uh just a few weeks ago, about a month ago, I got hit again. I got in front of two large interviews that had a lot of um, views. And, uh, you know, wham, bam, suddenly um, I got what appeared to be a flu at first. But when I got connected to quantum biofeedback, which we'll talk about in a moment, it was showing perverse energy and energy weapon type stuff. So, and this happens very commonly. You know, like Sasha Stone, he mentioned in his his 5G video that he had been attacked, and he didn't say in what way. But I would not be at all surprised if one major energy weapon attack. Uh, so there, this technology is being used in a lot of really heinous ways to suppress um, people's rights. So even if you don't think you've got something to hide. By buying into all of this stuff, you are enslaving yourself because, you know, first of all, you do have things to hide. But there are a lot of other people who are trying to do things to benefit you that are being suppressed because of this surveillance technology. So it behooves us all to oppose this technology, to minimize its use, and uh, to expose the wrongdoings that are going on with it. What kind um, of devices were you mentioning that you put on a phone or put on a computer or things okay. like that? Yeah. There are, I, there are, I ask that because I've seen they're sold by lots of different people and companies. And right. my impression and, is at least they don't all do anything. Right. Some work better than others. But basically what they are, they're little devices. They can be stickers. They can be little buttons. They can be made out of you know rubber or plastic or um, yeah. different materials, uh, shungite, uh, stone, different kinds of stones. But what they do, basically, if they work, uh, the ones that work, there are different ways of creating these technologies, but basically you have a material that puts out a localized scalar field, and that scalar field will structure conventional electromagnetic radiation. Now, if you think about it, you know, you can turn on a radio or a TV and pick up, you know, signals from TV and radio and Mm-hmm. satellite and that kind of stuff and uh, that that um, those waves are coming at us from all different directions sometimes they're coming from satellites sometimes they're coming from ground based towers but wherever they're coming from you know these signals are being beamed from different locations and so they're hitting us they're hitting the things around us and bouncing off and reflecting and so when they're when they hit us we're we're getting bombarded with all this different these different EM waves uh, coming from different uh, directions and when it passes through the body, it interferes with cellular communication. And so, when you create a scalar field uh, in your local area, then what will happen when all that normally random and chaotic those waves are coming at you from all different directions? When they hit that scalar field, they'll all become parallel to each other. So when they're passing through you, it's kind of like a stealth fighter. They're passing through you with a much lower profile. And they're much more quiet. They interfere with cellular communication much less. Wow. And so the cell phone devices that you put on, for example, we sell them at our website, freshandalive.com, that are little stickers that you put on. And these ones actually have been tested. They've been proven with the government's own SAR, specific absorption radiation testing, to show that these things reduce like 98% of the radiation effects from the EMF. 
And there are other technologies out there that do this. But these technologies are created, or these materials are created several ways. One way is by bombarding any material with scalar waves of certain frequencies, and it will alter the geometry of the atoms of the material. And those atoms will become little scalar wave antennas that will pick up this energy all around us all the time and then rebroadcast it in a local field. So, so what scalar energy are they using to broadcast? I mean, they're, they're picking it up, you said, out of the atmosphere, right? Right. There uh, are natural what, frequencies what? that are around us all the time. I mean, consciousness itself is a form of scalar energy. Okay. But these, these devices, by their structure, um, they create a scalar field that will structure the EMF in a way that makes it much less damaging. And so basically, um, you, you've probably heard that everything is energy. You know, when you look at matter at, at atoms and you look at the atomic and subatomic particles, the whole, what's called the Bohr model of the atom, where, you know, you've got particles that make up smaller and smaller particles. Right. That's all nonsense. When you get. Yeah, but I saw the Tinker Toys in, in third grade and they were real. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> These little there yellow have red been, green balls. There have been uh, imaging methods that show the uh, the structure of the atom in, in in the subatomic structure at the higher levels. So we do know, for example, there was a, a device that a man named Elmer Nemes developed called the Nemescope. And for people that want to Google this, it's N-E-M-E-S-C-O-P-E, Nemescope. Elmer Nemes developed a device back in the 50s that could magnify anything five million times, and it was strong enough that he could magnify and look at atoms, and he could see the interior structure of atoms. So we do know from that and tunneling electron microscopes and things, we have an idea of what the atomic structure is like, but when you get down below the, the bigger parts of the subatomic structure, we don't know, and it's because it's been shown that those structures are made of energy. Right. And so... Inside of the larger subatomic structures, you've got this so-called empty space that's not empty space. It's actually filled with light, and that is what scalar energy is. It's this superluminal light. It's kind of like the force in Star Wars. It's flowing through everything in the cosmos, and it flows through the subatomic structure of all matter. And that's why it can pass through matter like it's not even there. So there's no such thing as empty space. Correct. Correct. The so-called vacuum or, or empty space, yeah, yeah. it's not empty. It's got huge amounts of energy, and even conventional science uh, recognizes that now. You know, they say, for example, there's enough energy in a, in a thimble, uh, in this, the size of a thimble, to boil off all the oceans on the, on the planet. Right. So there are huge amounts of energy in so-called empty space because this energy is flowing through everything, and it's what we're made of. This energy slows down and coagulates into matter and the electromagnetic spectrum that we're familiar with. And so right. it can, it just it looks can like create matter. matter because of senses, basically. What's that? It just looks like matter because of how our senses are tuned, right? Well, scientists call it dark energy or dark matter because it looks invisible or black to us unless you have devices that can measure it. It's not easy to measure directly. It's not like you can pull out an EMF meter and measure this stuff. No, I meant this difficult. looks like matter. Right. Because of our senses. But it's right. only... This is, yeah, exactly. This is basically interpretation. holographic. We're, we're kind of in this holographic universe, and this superluminal light slows down and becomes physical matter, what we call physical matter. Right. Uh, but it's really composed of light, and you can see a lot. There's a lot of evidence for this. Um, so, for example, Curlian photography, when you see Curlian photographs, that's not, you're not seeing the life force of an organism because you can take an inanimate object and, and do a Curlian photograph and you'll still see these auras around them. What you're seeing is the object is electrified by the Curlian camera and then it uses a special imaging technology to capture the energy flowing off of the electrification of that object. And so what you're really seeing is the energy flowing through the fractal structure of the universe, when you see that lightning pattern, you know, coming off a Curlian photograph, what you're seeing is the energy flowing through the fractal structure of the universe. Interesting. Wow. So, getting back to EMF protection, yeah, these little localized devices, they put out a scalar field that structures the random and chaotic waves, makes them parallel. That's known as quantum coherence. And then they will pass through the body much more quietly with much less interference. That doesn't give you carte blanche 
to be living on your cell phone or being exposing yourself to Wi-Fi. It's just a, an extra tool to help protect yourself. You still need to avoid use, keep it at a distance, use an air tube headset, which is a, a headset that has the microphone going to six inches or so of empty tube, then to the earpiece. That keeps okay. the microphone away from your head because it's been shown that the, well, I mean, it's common knowledge that a head, a normal headset for a cell phone acts as an antenna. It's an ancillary antenna for the cell phone. So putting it right up next to the head, it sends that signal deeper into the brain. So you're, you're not talking about the Bluetooth transmitting things in your ear. You're talking about a wired headset. Wire. Correct. Okay. And Bluetooth is just as bad as a cell signal. You know, you're putting this massive EMF source right next to your That's stuff. That's like holding the phone on your head, basically. Exactly. And it, it does heat the water in your tissue. It accelerates brainwave states. It interferes with all kinds of stuff in the body. So those are really, okay. really bad news. So when the uh, cell companies try to say it's only the thermal effect that matters, these other effects are much more invasive than the thermal effect, right? Exactly. And that's well documented. Again, you know, it's it, they mention various documentation in uh, Sasha Stone's 5G apo- apocalypse video. Uh, I mention it on my website, our EMF protection information. Um, there's the you know the bioinitial report. There's tons of information showing that non-ionizing electromagnetic fields cause major damage, and there's increasing amounts of scientific data on that. So that's a flat-out lie when they try to say that there's not. What so, about the situation inside of new cars? With that in mind, yeah, that's they have a big lot issue. of wireless technologies cross-transmitting and everything. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Yeah, cars now have all kinds of wireless technology. Even if you don't utilize, you know, wireless technology in your vehicle, it's still it's still using. Probably it. got a wireless technology saying the air is low in the front right tire, <laughs> stuff like that. Yeah, and you know, satellite radio. Um, right. They have technologies that report information back to manufacturer. All kinds of stuff. And now also the black boxes in these devices, yeah. they've got wireless technology. Black boxes for those that people don't know what they are. Since 2005, all vehicles have been have these boxes installed that record your driving data, so that if you're involved in an accident, the insurance companies can actually determine if you were at fault or not. And if you were, a lot of times they will deny your insurance claim. Uh, so anyway, there's there is a, in in new vehicles there's a lot of wireless technology in them, um, and then if you've got a hybrid vehicle, you've got massive EMF from all of the um, electrical systems of the hybrid vehicles, you know, most of them like uh, Toyota Priuses, for example, they have like a 320 volt DC line that goes right underneath the driver's seat. Wow. So you've got to protect yourself from all this stuff. Yeah, and people so, think that anything semi-solar, like they call that, you know, the the advanced hybrids, people think of them as half solar and half petroleum. So it must be twice as good as just a regular gasoline engine. Now, hybrid cars and, and electric cars are a big, um, they're a big uh, false hope um, because you still have to generate power to charge them, number one. And that you're basically shifting the power generation from, you know, gasoline in your tank to some electrical power generator somewhere, yeah. usually nuclear or coal. Right. Um, it's not. It's not at all any better for the environment. Then on top of that, you've got the batteries that eventually ha- the chemicals have to be disposed of. Yes, right. they can be recycled up to a certain point, and yes, they can be reused up to a certain point. But eventually, you got to dispose of those you chemicals. You have to throw them away. Right. Right. Somewhere along the line, that those chemicals have to be. That something has to be done with them. Yeah, which means, but usually they're just dumped somewhere. I assume. Right, <clears throat> right. You know, um, th- these cars haven't been around long enough to see the long-term effects over decades. But eventually, you cannot recycle these batteries, and there aren't systems in place yet to recycle all of the chemicals. Maybe there will be one day. Well, plus, uh, if you're sitting right over a major power line, there are fields around the power line, right, that are going through your body. Oh yeah. Yeah. Now, I've measured EMF on different electric cars and hybrids, and I will say that the Tesla vehicles seem to be pretty well shielded because their EMF is not bad. Um, but uh, others like Toyotas and Hondas uh, and Chevy Volt, they have really high EMF uh, on the ones I've measured. 
Okay. So it's, you know, it's delusional, number one, to think that you're saving the environment by driving these vehicles. Um, you know, if you really want a vehicle that is good for the environment, you need to run it on water fuel because that's non-toxic. It has no negative side effects using implosive force technology, not, not mixing, for example, Brown's gas with gasoline, but using Brown's gas straight and running a car on a vacuum. Right. Which means Those splitting the hydrogen and oxygen apart from each other in the water at, right. on demand. And then recombining it, but okay. doing it in a way, it's not conventional electrolysis. It brings uh, scalar energy into the system, so it doesn't break any laws of physics, but uh, well, at any rate. But regular hydrolysis is too expensive, basically, energy-wise, right? Right, because you it takes more energy than what you get out of it um, yeah. with conventional hydrolysis. But, you know, I worked with Ewell Brown back in the 90s, Stanley Meyer, uh, Andrea Puharich, other people have developed water fuels that utilize um, pulsed resonance technology that can extract, it can convert water into a gaseous form that's like a fourth phase of water that's not steam and it can be burned. And when you burn it, it implodes back into liquid water with no side effects, no toxic side effects. Uh, and that creates very little energy to create. It's amazing how little energy it takes to create. Apparently, the government agrees that that's really a good technology. Because of their response to Stanley, I think. Exactly, yeah. Stanley Meyer signed like a, I think it was $80 million contract or something with the U.S. military to power all their vehicles with water back in the 80s. Yeah. And 30 minutes later, he was dead. Yeah. Poisoned. And I know some of the people that were in his crew, and I know what happened with him. And he was most definitely murdered um, because, yeah, he, he had a water fuel technology that would work. You could take any kind of water, salt water, polluted water. You could mm -hmm. even take radioactive water and make it non-radioactive. Um, and so, yeah, it could it could totally eliminate nuclear power, nuclear waste, clean up the oceans, you know, on and on and on. But nobody but him had that, the knowledge of how to do that? or what's Oh, no. Um, Stanley, I mean, um, um, Ewell Brown, who I worked with, he had had it since the 60s. William A. Rhodes uh, had it before anybody, any of those guys back in the 60s. Uh, Andrea Puharich had it back in the 70s, 60s and 70s. So, no, it's been around. It's really been around since the 1800s. Um, John Keeley and others worked with water fuel technologies. It's been around a long, long time. Um, and everybody who's holding it now has decided it's better be, to be quiet and stay alive? Or Yeah, yeah. because everyone I know that has had water fuel solutions... Uh, were either killed or suppressed. You know, right. there was a company in Florida, uh, down in South Florida, that had a, a device. I was floored when I went to a local, uh, like, uh, green energy show, and these guys had this Ford F-150 pickup truck running on water, right? But they didn't say that. They just said, oh, we've got this device that'll give you 60% better gas mileage, right? Uh-huh. And when I went, I went to the, they had this truck running. I went to the tailpipe and put my hand over it. Nothing was coming out but steam. And I said to the guys, you guys are running this thing on Brown's gas. And they were shocked. They're like, how do you know this? You know, and I said, because I worked with your Brown. Right. And they admitted it to me. They said, yeah, that's what's going on. But they don't tell that to the public. So um, as long but, as know, they don't ever say it, they seem to stay alive? Well, I don't know because these guys disappeared after a couple of years. You, you uh -huh. know, I don't know what happened to them, but I suspect that, right. you know, even sixty percent increase in gas mileage was probably enough to get them taken off the market. And there's been others. I've known others. If they were using it on Brown's gas. Why would they need any gasoline? Well, they don't. But when you when you run it on straight hundred percent Brown's gas you're running on a vacuum because Brown's gas will implode back into liquid water. So you run the engine on a vacuum, which you can do, but it takes a modification on a conventional car uh -huh. engine. Uh -huh. Whereas what's much, much easier to adapt is to mix it with gasoline at the time of injection into the engine. Right. And then it will make the gasoline much more explosive, much more explosive. Okay. And uh, that's one of the... One of the uh, difficulties in working with Brown's gas is it's so explosive, it'll blow an engine apart if you overdo it. So you got to be really, really careful to meter it very precisely. And that's part of the challenge of implementing yeah. technology. So these guys are around, but they've learned to not give anything to the public. 
while the ones are still around yeah most of them don't talk much about it for people that are interested if you really want to learn about brown's gas technology and water fuel and how to implement it uh george weissman at eagle research um he's got books on how to build brown's gas machines and stuff like that and he's probably the most knowledgeable person i know of alive that knows how to create brown's gas technology and i'm surprised that he hasn't been taken out but yeah you know, he well, shows they, they might figure that what he's putting out really is too hard for most people to use or else well i think that's it you know it's like when when you're having a real impact that's when people show up at your door i mean for example me yeah. i know i've been hit four times by energy weapons i know for a fact that i've got cia people on my mailing list and you know i've had government spooks show up at my presentations and things yeah. um, you know and people say well you know, you're just being paranoid how do you know i have confirmation in certain ways that i can't talk about i yeah. know you know so nobody has i mean i've had energy weapon attacks but nobody's tried to kill me um fortunately and yeah. you know i know not to cross that boundary i know not to go out right. saying certain things about free energy or whatever besides cars um what about people who have to fly on airplanes right now? What's the situation with that? Airplanes are one of the worst environments now for a multitude of reasons. Number one, the EMF, because you're inside of this cylinder. You're basically inside of a Faraday cage, and they, of course, have Wi-Fi in the planes now that you can connect to. And then people's cell phones, they allow them to be used on the planes now. So you've got hundreds of cell phones wow. around you operating you've got the planes wi-fi operating and you're inside this metal canister that's basically reflecting it all back at you and then to add insult to injury these days there are huge amounts of nuclear fallout up in the atmosphere that will bleed radiation into the airplanes um, and you can actually see people measuring this on geiger counters on youtube uh, dr patrick flanagan uh, who's a friend of mine uh, he has a really expensive like twenty thousand okay. dollar geiger counter that uh, he has used measuring the EMF, I mean, measuring the nuclear fallout in the atmosphere. And he said he won't fly unless he absolutely has to because it's at such dangerous levels. So, Does and I TSA know, let you take that stuff on the airplanes? Uh, Geiger counters? I yeah. don't know. I, I've seen people like serendipitously or, uh, you know, very quietly. Just um, not mention it or something. Yeah, they're, you can tell they're not like sticking out. and right, you know, swing, right. They're kind of like hiding it. And showing, you know, the the radiation coming in the plane from up, you know, and against the wall. Yeah. So I'm sure that they probably wouldn't let you, you know, if they knew you were doing it. Um, but but you can do that. You know, Sounds like a really health destroying environment, though. Well, it is, and I know for a fact because I travel a lot, and I, you know, I've gotten, I've trimmed my flight flying down way down from what it used to be. Yeah. But sometimes I still have to travel overseas. For example, I'm going to Bosnia in June. And that's like 20 hours of flying. And yeah. and I know when I get hooked up to quantum biofeedback machines, which can measure the perverse energies, it can measure the nuclear radiation in the body and that kind of stuff, it always shows all that stuff showing up. So, And, and whenever you get on the plane with a complete metal spacesuit, they always notice and don't like that. Right? Yeah, I mean, I fly with a mask that has silver and charcoal embedded in it. So you're and, not breathing the fumes, you mean, at least. And yeah. not breathing the bacteria of other people because there's and there's a lot of, you know, GMO chemtrail bugs in the atmosphere now as well. Um, again, not conspiracy, you know, these quantum biofeedback machines like the QXCI Skio, the Indigo, the Eductor, the Life System, these machines they can identify GMO biowarfare agents that are being showing up in these chemtrails that are being sprayed. Yeah. Uh, so it's not, you know, I'm not like reading stuff off the internet. I'm measuring this stuff and seeing what's in my body and other people's bodies. Right. And, um, you know, so we, we know this is going on. So it's you, just you, hard to avoid airplanes completely if you have to go places. I mean, you'd spend weeks driving and. No. Yeah, it is. So I, I've developed protocols, and this is one of the things I'm, I'm getting ready to release an article on my blog at Fresh and Alive blog about how to protect yourself against 5G and Wi-Fi and all of this stuff, all this wireless technology. But basically with airplanes, you know, I have a whole protocol of things that I do. First of all, I carry with me a first aid kit with stuff so that when I land, I immediately start taking supplements 
that will kill off any pathogens I might have picked up, any bacteria or viruses or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll take that as soon as I land so that I don't get sick. Yeah. And, uh, and I'll take certain things while I'm on the plane. And then, I, uh, for example, I have um, accelerated silver, which is a monoatomic silver, which is really good at killing pathogens. And I have an atomizer bottle of that stuff. And I'm constantly spraying that in my mouth and breathing it in. You can breathe it into your lungs. So yeah. I'll spray that, breathe it in deeply into my lungs from time to time when I'm on the airplane. And, and you've been able to get the little bottle of it onto the airplane without being called a terrorist or something. Yeah, yeah. You can go to health food stores and buy this stuff called Sovereign Silver or, you know, there any little atomizer. But if it's three ounces or less, you can carry it on the plane. So okay. I use like a one or a two ounce spray bottle and I put accelerated silver into that. Uh, for people that are interested, you can, you can go to, uh, actually my website, freshandalive.com has accelerated silver or uh, acceleratedhealthproducts.com. Okay. But that's a really, really good silver. Um, I also use chlorine dioxide, also known as MMS or CDS. Right. right. And so when I land, when I travel, I take MMS, which is two different liquids that you mix. It creates chlorine dioxide, which you then dilute in six ounces of lemonade. And then I drink that, you know, when I get to where I'm going. And I'll do that for a couple of days after I land just yeah. to make sure pick anything up or if I start if I feel like I'm starting to come down with something or if I get a sore throat anything like that I start doing these pathogen killers the silver the CDS usually that's all it takes um, and these masks you can get on Amazon they're embedded with charcoal and silver mm -hmm. they're about 20 bucks or so you just leave that on the whole trip I leave it on the whole trip and believe okay. me it's annoying because you know you're basically kind of rebreathing your own breath yeah, uh, yeah. To a certain degree, they do have this valve on it, so you're getting fresh air in. But um, and it slows it down. It does. So you know, it's it's a little annoying, but it's better than getting sick. Believe me, when yeah. I when I do my protocols, when I fly, I don't get sick. Well, uh, they're they're exposing the fact, besides microorganisms, that they've got uh, bleed air off the jet engines that's being used for everybody to breathe. Yeah. And that's kind of like exhaust. From a oh, jet yeah. engine. It's not and you can smell like, it. I mean, when you're sitting yeah. there on the runway, you smell it. It smells like, you know, jet fuel inside the inside the cabin. I remember um, as a little kid when we were traveling, even on propeller planes, you could smell fumes. And I always got really excited because it smelled like we were getting to ride on an airplane. But it was pollution <laughs> even before jets. Yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm. Now, another thing I do, um, I carry a a pocket device that I manufacture. It's, I don't have them right now because uh, I'm redesigning them, but I have this little pocket device called a stress shield that puts out a skater field and that protects you against EMF quite well. So I, I fly with that on the plane. I also usually bring one of my rest shield pyramids, which is a stronger skater wave generator that will protect against EMF. Uh -huh. And I really love that when I travel because when you're staying in other people's accommodations there's always wi-fi usually multiple wi-fi fields whether it's hotels or airbnb or whatever right. and i can't sleep in those places with wi-fi going so i usually shut wi-fi off in the place that i'm staying and i'll have my rest shield to help me protect against the emf and get into deep sleep when i'm traveling right. um, and then another thing too that i travel with i have this whole first aid kit that i travel with so i've got mms I've got accelerated silver. I have advanced TRS from Coceva, which is nano zeolites. Those you can actually spray in your eyes and you can spray in your mouth. And it's a, a mineral that will go into the body <clears throat> and latch onto toxins or pathogens and pull them out. And so uh, if you pick up any kind of pathogen or toxin, that's really good for pulling that stuff out and keeping you healthy. So I use that every day when I'm traveling. Okay. Um, and then also clays. I'll bring um, um, living clay from Vitality Herbs and clays and herbs. Um, you can use bentonite clay, any kind of absorptive clay. Um, and actually, uh, I make a mixture these days with that clay, uh, food grade charcoal powder, powdered uh, flax seed, a um, couple of other absorbers like that. And um, and then I'll just mix that into water and drink it down, and that'll pull stuff out of the gut. So if you start feeling anything, I, I do it before I start feeling sick, and I never get sick. But if for some reason, like I've been on trips where immediately I get off the plane and I'm 
driven to some place where I got to speak, and I, and I don't wind up getting to my hotel till late in the middle of the night. And so if I start picking something up in a situation like that, I just start doing my protocol and it knocks it out before it gets going. Right. And you talked about the stress shield. What does that look like? That's non-powered because it's for travel. It is powered. Is it it's, something you wear or have batteries or what? It's battery powered. You keep it in a pocket. It's about the size of a small cell phone, maybe half the size of a smartphone, thicker than a phone, but smaller. And uh, yeah, it's battery powered. You just turn it on, you leave it on, and you keep it with you. And it puts out a local skater field of about 15 foot radius. Oh. And that will structure the EMF around you, and it really, really helps much, much better than EMF pendants, which you should also wear, uh, EMF pendants or another thing, um, and protection on your phone, that kind of stuff. So what um, if you have to work in a factory or something where there's a bunch of electric machines around and wireless communications going through the room and, you know, this big room with a lot of machines and stuff, and you can't put walls between you and everything? Right. So should you wear a stress shield every day or what? Well, ideally, yes. And then also, you know, I've got a manufacturing facility that's in an industrial park, and we have to deal with this too. So what yeah. we've done is um, yeah. I put these skater devices like the harmonic shields that we sell on the actual meter, on the power meter coming in, and on the main breaker in our building coming in. So that what that does, that the skater field that that puts off will structure the electron flow of the electricity as it's going through the wires and that will reduce the EMF of anything connected to the wiring. So any device that's plugged into that wiring when it's running, those devices will help reduce the EMF that it puts off simply by structuring the electron flow. You call that a harmonic shield? Yeah, the ones we sell are called a harmonic shield and they're just these little stickers that you can put on the panels like and they've got a he- adhesive on them or something correct okay so you'd find practically speaking somebody's got a place that they're working that's really polluted like that you'd find the power coming in which is probably there's a meter at some point and then on the other side of the meter it goes to a circuit breaker box where do you put those things to really make it better? i put them on the meter itself i put them uh, on the main breaker of the electric panel and then I will put them on individual devices. And then also, um, you know, we're a manufacturing facility. We have all kinds of equipment and stuff, not wireless stuff, but, you know, we've got machine tools and that kind of thing. And we've got neighbors around us that have wireless technology. So um, I have my rest shield devices, which is the powered pyramid that mm-hmm. puts out a 20 foot radius field. And that really helps. So we put those all around the building so that the whole the whole building that we're in is blanketed with these skater fields that help protect against EMF. Okay. And then, of course, um, I don't allow cell phone use in our uh, facility, and we use soft phones through a computer rather than using cordless phones. And so it really keeps the EMF down quite well. Um, And so you can do those kinds of things. You use phones, in other words, when you say not cordless phones, you have phones that plug into the wall and have wires to the handset. Either that or in the case of our business, at home I have corded phones. Uh, At our business, we actually have these soft phones that are actually just a headset that plugs into your computer and you use the telephone through the computer. So there's no wireless. It's a wired computer. They used to have something like that that you bought and it was a UBS little like a flash drive or something and it had yeah. phone capability on it yeah Vonage like used to have that now people are moving to you know just using software on a computer or a phone or whatever but um if for people that are interested if you go to phones.com i believe it's phones with an s um okay. phones.com they have really inexpensive voice over ip uh phone service number one it's cheaper than Vonage and others and they also have a whole list of voice over IP phones that they work with. So basically, instead of having you know wireless um, technology in your phone, you have an internet cable that plugs into the phone and it works over the internet, over a wired connection. So you don't really have any EMF to speak of with that. So kind as of long stuff. as you don't use Wi-Fi for your computer, that totally right. avoids the bad fields. Right. And you know, it's smart. Right. 
if you're in business, especially, it's smart to use wired connections anyway because they're faster, number one. They're more secure. Yeah. They're not as easily hacked and spied on and that kind of stuff. But, yeah, just the, I mean, if it's at all possible in your environment, you should eliminate Wi-Fi and use wired connections. Right, certainly at home and also where you work if you have, if you can. And if you're in an environment like, you know, live in a neighborhood or in communal living like apartments, you know, you've got to stay away from banks of smart meters, number one. So at the very least, <sighs> choose a dwelling that's away from banks of smart meters or even a single smart meter. If you've got a home with a smart meter, get it replaced with a wired, right. non-smart meter. Most places you can still get them replaced if you right. want. Right. There's only, I think Pennsylvania is the only state I know of that actually passed a law mandating uh, smart meters with wireless technology. But I doubt that that's going to last because that yeah. just is such so damaging and it can be proven. If you're in an apartment and you can't move and you've got a bank of smart meters outside the wall, can you buy a sheet, a four by eight sheet of uh, aluminum or something and put it inside? No, no. Um, think about it this way. You could put, you could enclose the room that you're in on three sides with metal shielding and you're still going to be able to pick up radio and TV. So, Oh. Shielding, having shielding between you and a smart meter or a bank of smart meters is not nearly enough shielding. It'll just well, go around it. Picking up TV, it's in this all-pervasive TV field, right? The yeah, smart meters the same are thing. on line of sight, aren't they? Well, no. S- smart meters are not putting out beam-forming technology. They're putting out a field, and that field will just wrap around I a see. sheet of building and, and still get you. So it's now, not what cut you've got, off if there's a line of sight blockage. Right. What you've got to do is either encase the smart meter in some kind of a Faraday cage, which is a metal or a screen box that shields it, which you really can't do because the power company is going to show up. And yeah, tear they're going to take it off. Right. Right. So you yeah. can't do that. Um, but what you can do, if it's on your residence in most places, uh, you can opt out and have it changed to a non-wireless meter, number one. They call but it then if you're transmitting in- now. Yeah, if you're in an apartment complex where you don't have a lot of control over that, you've got to get as far away from the banks of meters as possible. And then on top of that, you've got to have protection as much as possible. You know, don't use Wi-Fi in your apartment. Right. Wear pendants, have devices. I don't know of any other device like my racial device on the market that will protect against yeah, EMF to the see. degree that it does. So either my rest shield devices or my home shield device – those are the strongest protection against environmental EMF that I know of. But yeah. it's still not the same as not being around that exposure. To yeah. The goal, it's kind the of gold like standard is get away from it, right? Right, right. because it's, it's kind of like noise-canceling headphones. You know, you can wear noise-canceling headphones in a really noisy room, and it helps, but it's not the same thing as silence. Right. And so, you know, I don't want people being deluded into thinking that with any wireless technology, and especially 5G, yeah. that, oh, we can just use a whole bunch of EMF protection and avoid use, and uh, everything's going to be hunky-dory. No. The first thing we've got to do is fight 5G and get it stopped. We've got right. to go to our local politicians and inform them, even if they won't do anything. We've got to inform them, because if you inform them and then you use... Um, the empower movements methods for putting them on legal notice that they will be legally liable if your health is damaged, then everyone who says no, they'll be legally liable when the lawsuits start flying. And the lawsuits yeah. will be flying. It's just yeah, like with the secret ministry. You know, it's been, the lawsuit factor is factored into the price of the technologies. Just we like had a, the secret We had know, a guy named Mark Steele on a show recently. I don't know if you've heard of him. He's in northern England, and he's trying out a test case against his own uh, city government, uh, holding them responsible, something related to in power, but a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And then Max Egan uh, just reported that in Australia and Sydney, they've apparently maybe stopped it for the moment. And he said that you can use the law in ways that you're not supposed to think of because other things like the laws about assault and they define assault and and this falls in that definition easily and if you can hold it personally against the 
people in office, then there might be a financial incentive for attorneys to get involved in. Exactly. Stuff and like that's that. it. That's the only way it's going to be stopped is people standing up and taking action like that. And, you know, they don't care about your health. They, you know, <laughs> town council, politicians generally are pretty gutless and they're not going to do anything, you know, to protect you unless there's a financial threat to them. Or It's their amazing care. how they manage to get the most unconscious people into office. Well, yeah, in general, you know, I mean, in my experience working with politicians at every level from the local to the national level, Mm -hmm. they're mostly power seekers who are looking to benefit themselves. And so they, yeah, they they are pretty gutless generally. There are some good ones. Not everybody's that way. Right. Uh, Some people do get into politics to change things, but an awful lot of them get in there just to benefit themselves and align their own pockets. Yeah, and they, a lot of those seem to be good at seeming like really nice people when they're running. Oh, and yeah. Then, then they act like they really are. Well, I've got friends who are local politicians here, and they're the nicest people you'd ever meet, because they have to be. <laughs> yeah, until they get into yeah. office, anyway. <laughs> That's it. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's like I get Christmas cards from people I haven't seen in 10 years yeah, because they're a politician. Right. right. <laughs> And you might want to vote for me just, you know, if you have a chance to. Um, so, one question I forgot to ask you about the 5G small cells, which are these little transmitters that I guess take the place of the big towers, the big 4G towers that are so right. gigantic. Um, they put out directed beams, right? right? Instead of general fields. Right. So, that must mean that they have the capability to put out a whole lot of beams at one time. Otherwise, only one person could use their phone in, in turn. Correct. Exactly. And they and all, they must have beams going everywhere. Exactly. Some and the thing of it is, too, you know, you may think, oh, well, you know, too bad for Joe Blow over there who's using his cell phone, but I'm not in that beam, so I don't need to worry about it. No. The way that beam forming works is it's constantly scanning to see what devices are around, and the devices themselves are going, here I am, here I am, here I am. So, so there's a scanning beam from the small cell and a scanning beam from the device, and they're going through you all the time. Right. They're, they're, I mean, that's how cell phones work now. They just use field technology where the cell phone is broadcasting in every direction. Here I am, here I am, here I am, and the towers yeah. are going, here I am, oh, there you are, and they yeah. start talking. And then as soon as – I actually had a roommate in college who worked for a company that – did the calculations for figuring out how to hand off from one tower to a next as you're moving, you know, from one area to another. And so it's it's very complex technology. But yeah, basically you're you're moving from this field technology where they're talking to each other constantly. Um, and you can see this on a cell phone. I've I've got a, a, a video on uh, YouTube called uh, Dirt cheap DIY EMF protection for your cell phone, and it's mm. basically showing people to turn their phones off. Yeah. But it shows that when your phone, even when it's not in use, being you know in a call or whatever, it's sending out signals because it's polling the towers. And so this beam forming technology is be yeah, it's going to be doing it with beams, you know, and it's sending that signal out stronger. If it's having trouble reaching the towers, right? So, for example, exactly. if you have the phone next to you in the car, you're driving exactly. along, it's not making a call, but it's in the passenger seat, and it's having to get through the metal in the roof. Exactly. So it's putting out more power because of that. Precisely. And it, it it's quite complex because it, it actually will calculate how to bounce the signal off of different objects to get to you. And then these satellite-based systems will beam directly down through buildings and stuff. So they've got to be really, really strong to be able to get through, you know, concrete and steel and stuff. Yeah, those uh, are the so ones that are starting to launch this year, right? Right. Yeah, it's bad news. It's really bad news. I mean, there are already certain big cities where 5G is being launched. Right. And not surprisingly, they're seeing things like mass bird die-offs yeah. and, you know, things like that going on. Mark Steele so, had a video that he went and walked through this park area, all these trees, and said, do you notice anything? No. Zero birds. Right. No sound. Exactly. And then they had just put in 5G in the area. Yeah. I mean, it'll kill, it'll kill all life, not just humans. It, it will kill insects, birds. Well, everybody. he said it hurts trees, even. Oh, absolutely. Showing all these trees losing all their bark because yeah. of these new towers. And yeah, stuff. absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, so we've got to 
be aggressive and go after this at a local level at least. And, you know, don't just go and rail against your politicians, but present the facts, present the scientific evidence. Right. Whenever you speak or present about this stuff to anyone, there's plenty of science and there's plenty of scientists, you know, showing the facts and statistics. So just quote that stuff. And show that big, one of the biggest sources you mentioned was the bioinitiative report, right? That's yeah, that's one of the big ones. Um, Sasha Stone's video points out a whole bunch of different sources that you can quote from right. uh, and YouTube videos that you can you can see. Um, but that's it. you know when I mean, you have to understand too, as a, a local politician, even if you want to do the right thing, you're dealing with a lot of different constituents with a lot of different needs, and there's a lot of different issues going on in a very small amount of time to deal with it all. And so, like, for example, in my my town, you know, you only get three minutes to present your case unless exactly. you specifically, you know, appeal for a longer amount of time. And so you can't say anything in three minutes. It's basically, hey, I've got a website or an information packet on this topic. Go look at it. Especially if they're not listening to you. Right. You know, when I went and got my three minutes in the city council, they were just texting on their phones and talking, and they didn't even listen. And say, exactly. okay, thank you so much. Next. Right. So what no. you've got to do is is instead say, um, you know, um, I'm putting you all on legal notice that you're going to be liable financially for my health if it's harmed. And here's the law supporting that. And here's the precedent where it's been done in other places, blah, blah, blah. That'll get their attention. You know, when you yeah. talk, like I've done this, I've gone to town council meetings and I address the individual council people by name and I say, Mr. So-and-so, you are going to be held personally liable, blah, blah, blah. Let me tell you, that gets their notice. <laughs> so, just for a second, what, what happened in that situation? Because I find that interesting. Uh, well, that was years ago in another town and the first of all, the, the, the council man was shocked when I did it. You can yeah, see you're not like, you're not reading your script. What's wrong? Exactly. Well, because they're used to mo what most citizens do is they just come up and complain. They just come up and go, I don't want that for yeah. whatever reason. Yeah. You yeah. know, they don't present it from a, a a balanced logical argument from the standpoint of you know really dealing with it as a public issue. Right. And they just complain, and so they're used to that. So they just go, yeah, yeah, let's get it over with. But when yeah. you come to them and say. You're going to be personally, legally liable and financially liable for this. They want to know what the hell you've got to say, and they want to know if you're a lawyer and that kind of stuff. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so in that case, um, it was it was in that case it was about a, a running a this is another big scam, but running a rail trail project through my backyard, and it, I lived on some acreage that had a um, a defunct rail line to the backyard and the rail company had sold the land back to the landowners. Um, and so we owned it outright so nobody could take it from us. But they, the local municip municipality wanted to run a rail trail park through it. And through this discovery process, what I found out was there's this huge scam that um, the utility industries created because it's very easy for a railroad to get right of way to run a rail line, but it's very difficult and expensive for a utility to get a right of way to run a utility line. So the utilities got the bright idea of partnering with the rail companies and getting the rail, paying the rail companies to go and put rail lines in where they didn't need them, and then abandoning abandoning them, and then uh, donating the abandoned rail lines after they'd been taken away under eminent domain from the landowners, instead of giving it back to the landowners, they, they lease it to the local municipalities as a rail trail park for 10, 15 years. And then when that lease is up, then the power companies or the, the utility companies, they take ownership of it for nothing, you know, next to nothing. Right. And they don't have to pay ongoing royalties and that kind of stuff that they would normally. So it's a big scam. The, the Rail Trails Act of 1983 was a law that was put in place to create this whole scam. And, uh, and of course, the, the whole Rail Trails project is, is run mostly by volunteers and funded by organizations uh, that have vested interest in it. And the people participating in it don't realize it. They all, like most people, are blind to the reality of what's really going on. And they think they're doing a good thing to promote you know, open space and parks and that kind of stuff, uh -huh. when what they're really doing is stealing land from rightful landowners with no due process. Wow. Wow. 
Oh, so did did that actually get somewhere when you stood up and said you guys are being put under, you know? Yeah, under- well, yeah, what wound up happening was uh, we stopped the whole initiative from happening. They What they wound up doing was building the rail trail up to the the point. There were, there were about five properties that owned the land outright that were the problem, and none of them would lease it or sell it or give rights away to it. So there was about a maybe a half mile of this rail trail that they couldn't run. So what they wound up doing was there was a large tract of land adjacent to it and they paid huge amounts of money to that landowner to run it around our properties across this other person's property. And it was that pr- that property was like over 100 acres so it was far enough away from the landowner they didn't care. Uh-huh. And uh, so they, you know, they got their way around it, but but we won. They didn't, you know, they weren't able to run over us. Mm-hmm. Um, but but you know, it takes. This is very very important for people to understand. You have to understand how to stand up for your rights. You can't just go griping and complaining. You've got to learn what the law is. You've got to learn how to stand up for your rights. And then when you go do it, people will take notice, and you will get results. It's, that's what's been so going on. I'd actually have to read some laws and like the state constitution and the city charter and exactly and um, you know read the signs of what's going on. There are already people that have amalgamated this stuff. It's not like you've got to go do hours and hours and hours of research. Okay. You know, you go and look at Sasha Stone's video of 5G apocalypse. There's a huge yeah. amount of resources there on the effects and the damage. And then uh, the Empower Movement. I think their website is empowermovement.net or org or something. Yeah. Whatever yeah. it is. I mean, the Empower it's, Movement. It, it sounds they really got, good. I've been watching it for years. And the only thing missing is I haven't seen a single case that's really gotten to what they say the conclusion is, which is when you collect damages. Yeah. And basically, you show that it can be done, and then it becomes a credible threat, not right. just making people nervous, but saying, oh, the, in the town over there, uh, the mayor got, you know, a, a, a awarded a judgment against him for $10 million or something. Exactly. And then they really start paying a lot of attention. I haven't seen that happen yet. And But studying does. those kinds of people that are taking those kinds of acts, you start to learn the truth about the law as opposed to what we're told about the law. Because, for example, you know, it's like if you, anybody who's ever had jury duty knows, you go to, you know, you go to jury duty and um, nobody in jury duty knows about jury nullification, which is the fact that the jury has all the power in a, in a trial. Right. And if it's a stupid law, they can just say that's the basis on which it's not guilty. Exactly. It's yeah. like, you, as a jury, you can rule however. It doesn't yeah. matter what the judge says or the attorneys say or whatever, but the judges and the attorneys will try to coerce the jury and make them believe that they need to, you know, do what the judge and the, the lawyers want them to do. Yeah, it's, it's the jury instructions from the judge right. are basically just commentary. They don't have any power, right? Right. So, I found out one of the quickest ways of getting out of jury duty is just to show up and start talking about jury nullification. If you don't want to do it. <laughs> You're out of there. The, the, the downside is of <laughs> that is that nobody who believes in jury nullification is ever on the jury. Right. Right, because they all went home. Exactly. Well, that's, what, what that's why they have jury selection, because the lawyers want to handpick the jury to favor them. So yeah, you you just go case. in there and say I just think he's guilty no matter what happened and they'd pick you right away. Oh yeah, I mean they're well and they do. I you know I've been through this several times and what they do is they they will interview all of the jurors, prospective jurors, and say you know have you ever had this happen? Have you ever had that? Let's say you know it's a trial over a. A homicide, a car accident where somebody died, right? Yeah, yeah. And so they'll say, "Do you know any? Have you ever been injured in a car wreck, or do you know anybody?" And so if you say, "Well, oh, yes, I was injured in a car wreck," or "Oh, my mother was hurt in a car wreck," you're off the jury immediately. Right. Be- you know? Well, don't the defense and the um, prosecution both get to interrogate the potential jurors? Yes. Yes. And, but but that's at different times, right? Um, in my experience, it was at the same time, one after another. Um, okay. But at any rate, they heavily pick over jurors, prospective jurors, to get the ones that they want that will 
support right. their position. So whichever. to get through, you'd almost have to say for the interrogation by the prosecutor, yeah, I think all these kind of people are guilty. And if an interrogation by the defense lawyer said, no, those poor people are being oppressed. And then if you manage to get through both of those, they might let you in, I guess. Well, the truth is they're looking for people who are unbiased for whatever the case is, number one. Yeah. Um, and then they also want people who are dumb enough to do what they're told. Right. So that's what they're looking for. They're looking for followers. They're not looking for leaders. They don't want critical thinkers. They don't want people with PhDs. They want, you know, Joe Blow average, you know, cold beer, hot dog eating kind so of guy. So did they ask you how much education you've had and stuff like that? Uh, I don't remember if they did or not, but you can tell by people's diction a lot of times okay. the degree of education they right. have or it, not necessarily education but let's say intelligence right like here where i live there's a lot of there are a lot of uh, lower income uneducated simple people who don't have uh good vocabularies and diction and it's obvious and okay. so yeah, they're going to do what they're told they're going to be more likely to do what they're told than uh you know someone like me right 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 Interesting. Because, I mean, if you had time, it's really attractive to get on as many juries as possible and have jury nullification if it's a ridiculous case or something. But it's hard to find unlimited time to do that. Well, you, if you, the moment you start talking about jury nullification, you'll be out of there. I mean, no, that's, you have that's to never I've mention it until the end. Yeah. And, you know, if you disseminate jury nullification information around, the courtrooms. Oh, yeah, you can get smashed to the concrete and beat Yeah, out. you can get arrested and all kinds of stuff. I mean, now I've done it. <laughs> I'll go serendipitously like laying jury nullification papers around the seating area of, of courtrooms and, uh -huh. you know, people see it. Um, but, you know, it's like when I bring it up, when I've had jury duty and I brought it up, I brought it up in a way that they couldn't wipe you know wipe it away they had to address what i was saying so that everybody there knew what jury nullification was by the time i got done and where you got rejected up. immediately right oh yeah yeah i mean they don't tell you you know in the moment they you know they you know after they've interviewed everybody then they tell you that you go sit down and wait and then they go oh you can go home yeah 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 <laughs> this is really weird living in a sci-fi movie like we are but. It's beyond Orwellian where we've gone because, you know, this stuff, when you look at, I mean, there are mainstream scientists who know the effects of this technology that are saying it's absolutely insane that anyone would even consider implementing it unless your agenda is to kill people. Yeah, I mean, if it's so, on purpose, it's a different kind of insanity. Exactly. And so that's the only thing I can surmise is that this is about population reduction. It's, yeah. You know, it's... You know, it's being presented as the Internet of Things, which is another thing we haven't talked about, really. The, you know, 5G wireless will enable the so-called Internet of Things, which is having every single device in your home, Wi-Fi, Internet enabled, connected to the Internet. Yeah, most reporting people data. think that's just super advanced, cutting-edge science, and it's going to be wonderful. Oh, and it'll be so convenient. I mean, you know, for example, right now, right now on the market, you can buy smart toothbrush that will... <laughs> Map, it will make a 3D map of your mouth and send it to your dentist or God knows who, uh, who knows else, you know. Yeah. They have smart toasters that will text you on your cell phone when your toast is ready so that when you're taking a crap on your Wi-Fi enabled toilet, which they actually have, uh, <laughs> you know, God knows why. In other words, it's a lot worse than what toilet. we're talking about. It's yeah. insane. And, it's and insane. farmers, the, the people who live in the rural you know, areas and don't want to be left out of this, they're not because I just read that now they have smart cows, which means your cow can wear a special collar that's going to say when it needs to be milked and how much, and it can lead the cow over to the milking machine, hook it up, you know, do the milking, and then send the cow back out to relax for the exactly. And that's that's part of the that's part of the um, convenience factor that's being sold not just to the general public but to industry is that there'll be all these amazing amazing applications and it's true. They it's will true. be pretty will amazing. Be, yeah. It yeah. Is. But at what price? You know. <laughs> yeah. So um, 
so that's that's how it's being spun. It's being spun as incredible convenience. You know, you can have your refrigerator connected to the internet, which you know they've already got. Yeah, uh, and, and and it can be like a computer that's the central hub of your house. And basically, that's why you need stuff. a smart meter too, right? So that you right can the smart it. meter. It's already been shown. There were a couple of professors at University of North Carolina who showed not only can you see from the power signature on a smart meter what appliances are being used. Yeah. You can actually tell what somebody is watching on television through this right. power signature of their smart meter. You yeah. know? Now, these are a couple of professors that showed this. Well, so, in the moment, it might be for marketing. <clears throat> Later, it's like you're trying to watch an unauthorized TV show. Well, exactly. And here's you're the thing. Or busy. you're having an unauthorized thought. Because believe yeah, it or not, exactly. as they showed in these, these weapons experts in the 5G apocalypse, they combine the, this technology can be combined with LED lighting and other technologies in your home to actually read your mind, believe it or not. And right. if you think that's crazy um, uh, conspiracy theory, DARPA already has patents and information on their website about this technology to yeah. read people's minds using which, these. Fields. Which is all based on the fact that thoughts and emotions have their own energy fields, right? Exactly. So it's well, it's all scalable. It's all skater energy. And see, the, the, you know, the military knows all about this. You know, they've got skater okay. weapons. They know in in great detail about skater energy, and they understand consciousness is skater energy. And they've been utilizing technologies to manipulate consciousness, including skater wave technology, for years and years. Um, I met a guy who was uh, an insider in the military who told me that they have skater technologies that they are modifying the frequencies, the Schumann frequencies that come out of these um, ley lines, as people call them, on the Earth. You know, at the center of the Earth, you've got this singularity, this black hole that's emanating skater waves. And when it when they come to the surface, they're coming out in, in a specific geometric pattern because the singularity at the center of the Earth, it's not just this round ball of energy or this black hole. It's It has a geometric shape. It's shaped mm -hmm. like a cube inside of an octahedron. And so at the apexes of the, the geometry, you've got these vortices that come out and they hit the surface of the Earth. And then gravitation and the rotation of the Earth pull that, that vortex down across the surface of the Earth. And that's what creates what are called the ley lines. They're right. scalar vortice lines. And so... Which are like l lines of latitude and longitude, right? But they're just based on energy instead of geograph geography. Exactly. And... The you know the government knows very well about this because on, along when you're close to these ley lines, it enhances health and um, consciousness of any organ any organisms around there. So they've been utilizing scalar technologies to change the frequency of these ley lines to suppress consciousness and suppress people's health. Make them actually negative. You can use them as transmitters of negative energy. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Which will suppress consciousness, make people dumb down, make them lethargic not feeling like protesting, make them die yeah. off earlier. Yeah. In fact, kind of they'll help you suppress the protesters. Right. Which I think is being dumb demonstrated now. Well, well you and I know <laughs> we had an experience where we, we found out that there was a skater technology on a, a telephone pole near your, not far from your house. Uh-huh. And you remember, if you remember, we I don't know if we can get into the details, but basically... I've seen confirmation on more than one occasion, including your time, where yeah. we've seen evidence that there's skater wave technology on these cell towers. And a lot of these detectors people don't understand. Detectors, you mean, right? What's that? Detectors. No, not detectors. Transmitters. Wow. Transceivers. Oh, okay. okay. receive and transmit. Right. And, um, and this has been confirmed to me by a couple of people who know about it. But we've seen evidence, like independent evidence, on our own through serendipitous events mm -hmm. that these, these cell towers, and there's people have to understand, there's not just the big towers that you see. There are lots and lots of smaller towers that are hiding in light poles and mailboxes yeah. and different things that you wouldn't even realize. You know? Right, right. Because, I mean, that happened in your case. It, it, the tower near you looked like a light pole, didn't it? It's still there. It's less than 300 feet away. But it's disguised to look like a light pole, right? It looks, you look really closely at it, and it's just like the other light poles, except there's no light. It's just a, a straight up pole with no cross piece on it. And at the top, it's got some decorative thing, and it's just like a statue, and it's transmitting. It's, right. it's a cell tower. And these, these 
towers, these these mini cell towers for 5G and, and the 4G towers, they're being hit in all kinds of different devices, church right. steeples, towers, right. all kinds of things. So, you know, it's, it's around. Um, but it's important for people to understand it's not just cellular service that's being broadcast in these towers. There's all kinds of different technologies, some of the military, I suspect, that are being utilized. And when you combine that with 5G satellite-based stuff, there ain't going to be nowhere to hide from this stuff. Somebody told me that those satellites are going to be, um, I think it was Mark Steele. I I thought they'd be using solar power or whatever was most efficient and broadcasting the 5G beams down to the ground. But he said they're actually going to be taking their power from the ground transmitters and then redirecting it. Do you know about that? They're going to be taking power from the ground. Oh, you're talking yeah, about the satellites? Lot. Yeah, the satellites will be taking the power from the ground stations and redirecting oh. it to places where there aren't enough uh, ground stations. Oh, yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know. I haven't heard that. Yeah, but it wouldn't surprise me at all. Apparently, because Elon distribution Musk is the big problem with this stuff. Yeah, Elon Musk's company is really involved in all the satellites from what I've heard. Yeah, I think SpaceX, which is just a half hour down the road from me, they're going to send yeah. up... 7,000 uh, satellites. Boeing is going to send up another five, and then there's a couple other companies going to send up several thousand. So in total, it's about 20,000 satellites. SpaceX is his company, right? Right. You know, I thought he was supposed to be this really wise, smart guy. Well, I suspect that I know from seeing him speaking publicly, I know he thinks that between AI and other threats, that I think he thinks things are already lost. Number one, but yeah. and I can't speak for him, so I don't know if that's what he really thinks. But I also know that you know Tesla's not doing well financially. I don't know how SpaceX is doing, but these contracts would make billions and billions it's of dollars. It's a really good money making opportunity. Right? Exactly. So it may be something that he can't afford to turn down. And if uh, the world is already hopeless, then it doesn't matter, right? Right. And you never know, somebody might have uh, coerced him as well, you know, that yeah, happens. Yeah, exactly. He'd be an important target. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the bottom line is it, it sounds like until this stuff stops, the countermeasures and defense of yourself and your family and other people is really going to be the whole issue. Yeah. yeah uh, I mean, although I have do- to say one other thing about that, and that's that even if you did have this field around you that was perfect... It doesn't protect the other life forms like bees and animals and trees and all that stuff, which you kind of need to be alive. Right. Now, my home shield device will protect a large area outdoors. It's actually designed to clear chemtrails, but it will, and it does that for a 75-mile How radius. How much can you tell us about that? Because I think that's important. Well, and that's, that is important because the chemtrails are, you know, geoengineering, if you want to call it that, metal, metal aerosols that are being sprayed in the atmosphere and other things. Um, they, are com- they combine with this wireless technology for different purposes. And I know right now from what I've seen and from what I've heard from people in the know, um, the metal aerosols that are being sprayed they act like this blanket when they when they spread out over an area that acts kind of like an inductor so that when you send energy down from satellites or towers or whatever, it will redirect it, spread it out evenly over the ground. So if you want to suppress consciousness or... Like a lens, people, kind of, right? Or yeah, exactly. It's, it, right. It's, it spreads the fields or the beams more evenly in the area and affects more people more evenly. Okay. Um, and so that... And there, I'm sure there are other uses that is going to be combined with 5G technology. I know Mark Steele also mentioned that um, it's going to be combined with nanotechnology that's in these chemtrails that we breathe in so that we can be individually identified by frequency and probably manipulated individually by frequency. Um, I know um, I had a friend who was in the Desert Storm, the first Desert Storm um, military campaign, and uh, he had nanotechnology in him, and they used that was used for voice of God technology, which uh, he would hear his commanding officer after he got out of the military. He would be in places just like, you know, 
dancing at a club or at a gas oh, station, and here's commanding yeah. officer telling him to do something using this voice of God technology combined with the nanotech in his body. So, And was that really happening at the time that he heard it remotely? Well, he said that it was crystal clear that he heard his commanding so officer wasn't, telling him. It wasn't just a memory. It was actually real time. No, no. He said voice. it was just like listening to a person standing next to you talking. Okay. And okay. I mean, you can you know you can go online and and search on voice of God technology and see there are patents for it. This is not like a conspiracy theory; there are actually patents for it because the the human skull is a resonance chamber, and so you can you can hit it with different kinds of frequencies or sound even and, and create a sound inside the skull, right. um, or affect the neural pathways in the brain and give you the impression that you're hearing sound. Right. Uh, right. There, there's a lot of there's a lot of technologies people wouldn't believe they would think is just conspiracy, but there there are people that have documented this. There's a, a great book by Jim Keith called Engineering Mass Control, Engineering Human Consciousness that just is the tip of the iceberg on some of these technologies. But if you go on Amazon and just search on mind control, uh, you'll find tons of books by people in credentialed positions that know that have worked with these technologies that are exposing what they can do, and it's just unbelievable. Wow. Um, you know, I'm reading one right now, I don't remember the title of it, but it's a guy who was an insider, and he's saying that that it absolutely, they already have the technology to read people's minds. Wow. Energy technologies, not like hooking them up to some device, yeah. but using a field to read a person's mind. Well, we know that they can go into a person's dreams and change the dream. <laughs> And actually give orders to the person through the dream or warnings or things like that. Oh, yeah. Uh, right. Well, even my devices, the, the red shield and home shield devices, they're skater devices, and they operate at natural frequencies that are created by the minerals in them, and mm -hmm. they will actually heal you. But it's not unusual for people about the first week that they get one of these things to have unusual dreams because they'll actually promote emotional healing in the dream state. And so you might be having these really weird, active, colorful dreams in the dream state that's about releasing anger or stress or whatever. Right. And um, I mean, I, I had some really funny, interesting dreams, very vivid, colorful dreams for the first week that I, I used uh, the rest shield. Um, so absolutely, different kinds of energy can affect you in the dream state and so, your dreams themselves. Uh, the rest shield, you know, because I've had one for years, it's a little pyramid about that big and... Um, I've got it about three feet from my head where I sleep, and it really seems to be good. What's the difference between that and the bigger device that you guys sell called the Home Shield? The Home Shield, originally I developed it for clearing chemtrails. And, well, really I developed it starting out to stop the nuclear fallout that was coming from Fukushima. Because when I heard about uh, Fukushima, the first thing I thought was I wonder if uh, if somebody used a skater weapon to create the earthquake that caused the tsunami. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. of my background working with advanced technologies, that was my first thought. So I went online and Googled um, Fukushima skater weapon, and one of the first things that came up was the Minister of Finance of Japan saying that the United States had used skater weapons three times against Japan, including Fukushima, to blackmail them into economic policies against China. And so here this guy was on camera stating this. And this is the guy who reports directly to the prime minister of Japan. Right. So um, I saw that and I said, okay, well, if there's somebody, you know, if people are using skater weapons to create these problems, there's probably people out there that are using skater energy to neutralize radioactivity. I knew from working with Ewell Brown, I had seen radioactive elements neutralized. So I went looking around, and sure enough, there were skater technologies that would do that. And it turned out that, you know, the, the rest shield that I was manufacturing, that technology could be applied to that. And so I spent about a year and a half, hardly ate, hardly slept, and worked my butt off, and did a lot of experimentation, and fi finally came up with this device that you put outdoors, and it basically creates a skater field and a vortex. And the, the vortex is... Um, it's like an upside-down tornado of skater waves, mm -hmm. and the apex of the tornado is out in space, and so it acts like a vacuum cleaner, and because of the frequencies, it operates at natural mineral frequencies It will only resonate with pollutants and things that are not supposed to be in the atmosphere, and it'll pull them out into space. And what that does is it cleans the atmosphere, 
And when you clean the atmosphere, um, you get rid of all the charged particles that throw the atmosphere off, and that normalizes the weather. So what we found was that, I mean, first of all, the, it cleared the chemtrails like nobody's business. I mean, it, for a 75-mile radius, I was just blown away. Yeah. And the nuclear fallout, we started doing rainwater tests and, and different kinds of tests. And what we saw was that this stuff, it actually will clear the atmosphere. And, and, and so, you're saying it just goes it, it unlimited distance out into space. So, Well, it it's it has a focal point, but it, and I don't know how far out in space it is. Um, theoretically, scalar waves go on forever. Um, okay. And they, but really, these are like vortices that fold in on themselves, just like a tornado. So they get stronger as they go away from their source up to a certain point, where they, they then they taper off. Right. Okay. So it's um, like it gets bigger and then it gets smaller. Right. But um, the field so, that it puts off, it also protects against EMF. It does all the things that the rest shield does. So it protects against EMF. It helps you get into deep sleep. You know, okay. it pulses at the Schumann resonance and and other frequencies. So it. It so does all I, of that. Ideally, if if there was no money issue or no other kind of issue about putting out rest shields, what spacing would you have between rest shields to protect a whole area of geography? About air, rest shields indoors. No, about a rest. No, I'm home sorry. Home shields. Home shields. Yeah, I missed. Home shields um, for for EMF and sleep and that kind of stuff. About every hundred feet, hundred fifty feet. Um, but for you know clearing the atmosphere of pollution, right, right? You only need one every seventy-five miles. Wow! And it has other benefits too. It it actually the skater waves that it puts out plants feed off of them, and so you'll get about uh, a third higher growth rate with plants. Um, and, and also, if you had that's, more than one every seventy-five miles, it would be okay, right? Wouldn't hurt. Oh yeah, absolutely. We've got them in various places, like around here. I've got a bunch of them around, and um, yeah, they don't interfere with each other or anything like that. So, what have you noticed with a bunch of them fairly close in where you are? What, how, how effective is that being? Well, it's hard to tell because one pretty much takes care of everything. So when you put more within 75 mile radius, you just well, see more of the same thing. I'm saying whatever number it is that's doing it, what, a, what overall effect are you seeing? I mean, obviously, if a plane goes by, it's still spraying. But what happens right. to the line of spray after that changes? Okay, right? well, with a chemtrail plane or geoengineering plane, if you want to call it that, yeah. Um, yeah. what you see normally when they're not using, normally when they're spraying, they're, they use, sometimes they use what are called scalar interferometers along with that. And what a scalar interferometer is, basically it's an antenna that broadcasts a scalar field over an area. Okay. And that will make the chemtrails hang in the sky longer. Huh. Because in some places, like for example, Sedona, where you live, there are natural geological formations that will create these natural skater vortices that will clear the atmosphere. Uh -huh. So in order to counteract that, they'll bombard the area with skater waves and then spray, and that'll hold it in the sky longer. So if they're using that technology, with my device, you'll see an ind individual trails will disappear within a half an hour, usually 15 minutes or so. But they'll keep spraying and spraying and spraying. They won't stop. You know, I've, uh -huh. I've seen instances here where they've come and had 12 or more planes and just spraying nonstop around the clock for days. And right. so you're going to see the trails. But as yeah. soon as they stop, it clears up. They don't get to the ground is what you're right. saying. And then long term, uh, you see normal weather for your area. You don't see these crazy weather extremes. Yeah. Like in yeah, Florida, for example. You know, I've got these devices along the east coast of Florida. And uh, we haven't been hit by hurricanes in ever since they've been out on the right. east coast it stays outside they either stay offshore mm -hmm. outside of the range of these things or they go west i haven't been able to get them on the west coast of florida um yet yeah and so florida got hit last year with the hurricane irma but uh but everywhere we put them we see weather extremes just go away wow yeah that's a really big deal now, and it's not modifying the weather. This is a very important point. It's not modifying the weather. All it's doing is clearing the atmosphere of pollution. When you clear the atmosphere, that balances the weather. 
the real weather modification is what's being done with this geoengineering and all these other things using to manipulate weather. So, in other words, there's some kind of a natural intelligence consciousness force that tends to harmonize the weather automatically. And when you get in the way of that with putting pollutants in the air, then it reacts crazy, right? And if you get rid of the pollutants, it goes tends to go back toward normal. Yeah, severe weather is nature's way of cleaning and balancing itself. So, when you see hurricanes and tornadoes, that is the earth cleaning itself. When you see lightning, that is the earth cleaning itself. One of the things I noticed when, you know, we're in the lightning strike capital of the world here in Florida, yeah. and one of the things I noticed is when we I first put my device out, we went from, in the summertime, we normally have a thunderstorm and lightning storm almost every day, yeah. three, four months. When I put the device out and it cleared the pollution and balanced the atmosphere, three lightning, I only saw three bolts of lightning all summer, which is unbelievable for Florida. Right. Right. Um, but that's... That's because all of this extreme weather is the Earth trying to balance itself, you know. Yeah. And, and you, you know, it's very complex. Human consciousness itself is involved in weather because we're skater wave generators, too. And yeah. so it's not yeah. like, you know, yeah, exactly. 2,000 so years ago. if you ago, program all the people to be crazy, then your weather may have, be reflecting it to some degree. Absolutely. Others. And, you know, 2,000 years ago when there wasn't the all the man-made pollution that there is now. Yeah. There weren't as you didn't have the weather extremes, but you still had weather because the humans that were here combined with the earth itself, which is a living organism, right? All of that it does it utilizes the energy of consciousness of skater energy, and so you're going to see these variations, but you're not going to see the insane weather that we're having now, right? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a vast, super interesting field, and they're old stories of indigenous people all over the world being in touch with the earth and the weather and the sun and all the realizing that every one of these entities is conscious and self-aware and capable of communication with humans and then when the when we started being brainwashed into the modern science i remember from very early i was in elementary school and they were teaching us that well now we have modern science and three-stage rockets and running shoes and everything and the old people who believed that everything was alive they were just superstitious and now we know they had, how everything yeah they, well it's been shown there are people that know they had far greater knowledge of this stuff than we do now and um, they the were ancient projecting Greeks. energy to change the weather and bring rain and all kinds of stuff oh yeah yeah i mean well i've seen it done i've i've been with lakota indians and seen them change the weather in a yeah. perfectly blue sky not a cloud in the sky and make not only a cloud form, make a cloud form that was like a, a ring. Yeah. Right over the the group that was meditating to do this. And they didn't and even have AC current. Exactly. <laughs> it's because we are skater wave antennas. And when we get together in ceremony, this is why people throughout history have gotten together in ceremony and do this thing. Because consciousness is skater energy. Skater energy can create an ultra matter and other types of energy, you get together in a circle with other people in ceremony, you're a whole bunch of skater wave antennas that are creating a vortex, a right. vortex skater waves. It's not just to do this thing to make ourselves feel better. No. There's something it, happening there. Yeah, you're, you're creating a carrier wave. When you get together with other people, you're creating a large carrier wave that will accelerate the manifestation of your thought into reality. Right. That's really, from a physics standpoint, kind of how it works. Yeah. That's why when you do a sweat lodge, anybody who's ever done a sweat lodge knows you do a sweat lodge, stuff starts happening in your life. Yeah. It's because you're in ceremony with a group of people in a very intimate space and you get into this um, environment that puts you into an altered state that opens you up to that and makes it much more powerful. That's what's yeah. going on. Yeah. And eventually, of course, the suggestion is why not live in that state and change exactly. the entire experience of your life, right? Well, this is part of the way that we're going to survive 5G and get all this stuff stopped. It's like, you know, we've got to strengthen our bodies as much as possible with diet and nutrition, detoxification, yeah. uh, use EMF protection, avoid the technology as much as possible, and then get together with other people and do meditations, do breath work, do body work, do right. these things to create this energy to protect yourself and to change the planet for the better. Right, and then don't drop it the minute you get up from so-called meditation. Right. Stay in it. 
while you're doing everything else. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Um, okay, well, I kept you over time. I'm sorry, but we could go for another 10 hours and it'd be <laughs> fine with me. Hopefully, we'll do um, some more shows in the not distant future. And one of them that I was thinking would be for some of the really interesting conferences that you're going to uh, do something from there and share what you're. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to. I'm going to be in Bosnia in June, uh, middle of June, and that's always really fascinating because they are always having healing miracles and all kinds of stuff happening there. Yeah. People go inside those pyramids. For those that aren't familiar, the largest pyramids so far discovered in the world are in Bosnia, and they've got these tunnels that are arranged very geometrically and geomantically inside of these things. There's right. actually a whole complex of pyramids. And people are going inside these tunnels and getting healed of major diseases like stage four lung cancer and you, yeah. you name it. So, so I'll be there in June. And then July 4th weekend, I'm going to be in Washington State at East SETI Ranch flagging in UFOs and ETs. That's uh, and that, that, what's the name of that guy? Um, James, James Gilliland. 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 Gilliland, yeah, and he's got all kinds of ET stuff going on at his. Oh range. yeah, yeah. If you go on go on uh, YouTube and search on ECETI, E C E T I, you'll see videos of them where they've filmed UFOs flying, flying saucers flying over their property, and right. all kinds of like. Which you uh, have to be really brave as a UFO pilot these days because you get shot down right away. <laughs> yeah, apparently. One of the speakers at that event is going to be Corey Good, who's a secret space program insider, and he has said that we've got technology now to stop these uh, extraterrestrials from coming in. So, yeah, uh, yeah, at least exactly. some of. Them. So uh, maybe if you feel like it, we can do something from those sites. I think that would be fun. Yeah, yeah. I know his internet connection is not great, so we'll probably have to do it by audio only. But uh, okay, that's all right. Yeah, we can still be. We can fun. definitely do it. Yeah. Okay, so um, if people want to find out more about all these devices that I think would be really good to learn about, uh, they just go to freshandalive.com, right? Mm -hmm. And my blog, freshandaliveblog.com. I'm getting ready to put a, an article there about how to protect yourself from 5G. Okay, great. Um, and my YouTube channel, if you go to YouTube, search on Fresh and Alive or Ken Rolla, R-O-H-L-A. I'm on there, too. Okay, yeah, sounds great. So, thanks for all the time, and um, hold on, and we'll say goodbye in the break here. All right. Thanks, Richard. Yeah. So, that was Ken Rolla. I hope you guys got a lot out of it. It seemed really relevant and interesting to me, and the bottom line of all this stuff is not necessarily memorizing every detail of all the horrible stuff that the people ruling this planet are doing right now, but the bottom line is always, you know, with, with that perspective and um, strategic awareness, what what can we do to protect ourselves and then from there other people that are close to us and not so close even. And I think there's a lot and, and certainly what he was talking about goes right along with what we've been saying that it all of the positive, harmonic and um, protective things that we can really do are all based on our own inner growth and what the work that we're doing inside. Most people are not going to relate to that as anything real, but if you're one of the ones that is beginning or farther than beginning to realize that the massive power to, to heal the world at this point, even this late in the game, is being carried around in a dormant state, unconscious by every person on the planet. And any of us that decide to do the work to wake that up, we can help on as big of a scale as we want. And it doesn't mean that you stop doing your external work or, you know, your job or your family or anything or, or working for good causes that you're involved in. You keep doing that. It's just when you do the work to upgrade your own thoughts and emotions and start separating from the programming that gives everybody a false identity and keeps limiting us in what we can do. Once you start separating from that and replacing it with the direct input from the source that we came from, then you become as powerful in a positive sense as you're willing to, to work for. And in the, on the path to that, in the meantime, starting now, 
some of the technology and the devices and things that Ken is inventing and developing are really good. I know because of what I've used from him. And to learn more about that, I would reiterate it. it's a good idea to go to freshnalive.com or his uh, blog site, freshnaliveblog.com, fresh and alive. And that, I think, reflects the, uh, the health work that he's done, healing with raw organic food and that sort of thing. And he's one of the not that common small group of people that have, have meshed a, uh, an awareness of the organic raw food and lifestyle enhancement healing protocols with technologies that are uh, life-friendly based on uh, scalar wave technology instead of the destructive microwaves that have been chosen to help destroy humanity. I think um, it's an unusual con- uh, combination will uh, really worthwhile to stay in touch with what he's doing, which I do as well. And I'm using his rest shield every every day and and sleeping close to it. It's a really good thing. And the larger one, the the uh, home shield that he was willing to talk about, amazingly for us, uh, I've seen those in action too, and they're amazing. So I don't know everything about it, like. You know, even the amount that he does, but what I've seen so far is 100% positive. So, getting those disseminated or dispersed as widely as we can, wherever you live, the home shields especially, I think that would be a really good thing to do. And I'm not making any money at, at this point at all by recommending it to you, but um, that's good because it, it, it means that I'm clearly recommending things in my own experience that have been beneficial and I'll try to keep doing that um, and we'll, we'll keep putting up videos you know free videos on all the major platforms as long as we can and if we get kicked off if and when we get kicked off stay in touch with uh, us at lostartsradio.com and uh, our videos will still be posted hopefully at brighteon.com b-r-i-g-h-t-e-o-n dot c-o-m um Support us if you have money and feel like keeping us on the air and keeping our work going. There's a donate button at lostartsradio.com. If you're so inclined, it would be really appreciated because we're not even at survival level yet. And uh, for those of you who want to go deeper than what we can go into on the public venues, check out planetaryhealingclub.com, planetaryhealingclub.com. And I would meet you there live every week for an interactive uh, private platform if you get interested in going to that level. And in the meantime, um, we'll keep bringing up the best guests we can find, inspiring people and and projects for the Sunday shows. Let other people know if you can. And um, remember the main power source is inside you and you can connect to it and it can transform your life. So thanks for being here and we'll see you next time. (laughs) 